All right, good morning, everybody. Let's see if this is taking like it's supposed to. So far, it is not. All right, good morning, everybody. I don't know if you caught that delayed beginning or not. I don't care at this point. Ah, we're in the book of Luke, chapter number four. Matthew, Mark, Luke. For third book of the New Testament, fourth chapter of that book. We started uh, on the 1st of December and have been enjoying so far the birth of Christ. Yesterday talked a great deal about John the Baptist, his baptism of repentance and so forth. And now we're going to see a chapter that we've probably seen either here or in Matthew chapter number four, the temptation of Christ, as well as some other things that are going to go on. We got a little over 40 verses, so we keep getting shorter and shorter chapters, although Luke is known for these lengthy chapters. He is a doctor. He's a detail-oriented individual, and so we get a lot of stuff from him, and that's good. It's a good thing. So let's pray, and we will start Luke chapter number four. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for what it means to us, what it teaches us. I pray today we would learn more from it, and I pray the things that we would hear and learn today, we would seek to apply to our own lives. Give us the mind of Christ, please, as we read and study, and give us understanding and wisdom from it, and please use the Spirit to change us from the inside out. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. All right, here we go. Luke chapter number four, verse number one. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit leads Christ into the desert, and he's going to spend 40 days and 40 nights here fasting, praying, and resisting the temptation of the devil in his life. Verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So this is the end of the 40 days uh, when we see these temptations. Verse 3, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And so you see how Satan works. Satan always questions everything that God declares. Somebody put it this way, the devil always puts a question mark where God put a period. And so he starts right out, if thou be the son of God. So he's trying to play on Christ's willingness to defend himself. But Jesus owes the devil nothing. He doesn't owe him an explanation. He doesn't owe him an answer. He doesn't owe him anything, and he's not going to fall for this trap. So he could turn the stone to bread and eat it, but he does not do so. Verse 4, and we'll see here that Jesus answers every temptation of Satan with Scripture. So when you and I answer the temptations of the devil in our lives, we ought to use Scripture to do it. It's hard to use scripture if you don't know the scripture, right? And that's why we study every day. So chapter four, verse number four, and Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And so it's not just physical nourishment we need. It's spiritual nourishment. Jesus is telling Satan here, I'm not out here to feed my body. I'm out here to feed my soul right now, feed my spirit. Verse 5, And the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That's pretty interesting. That puts it differently than Matthew does, if I recall. So he sees all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. It's as though the devil shows him some sort of uh, hologram, maybe. I don't know. It's very interesting to consider. And the devil said unto him, verse 6, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. Now, this is one of those rare instances where the devil is telling the truth. It's a half-truth. All of his truths are half-truths. But he does have the, the power over this world and over this earth right now. God has temporarily allowed him that. He is the prince and power of the air. And so he offers to Christ 
these things, and even more, he says, uh, will he give it. Uh, verse 7, if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. This is pretty interesting, isn't it? The creator is being tempted to worship a created being. And this shows the pride of Satan to think that the one who made him is going to then bow down to him. The arrogance there knows no bounds. Jesus answered, verse 8, and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so we don't bow down to anyone or anything other than God himself. Verse 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. And look at how Satan talks, verse 10, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So now Satan takes him to uh, the pinnacle of the temple, a high point, and he tells him, J go ahead and jump, because the Bible says that he will give his angels charge over you or protection over you. And so he's tempting him to tempt God. And he's, he's sort of saying, okay, you want to talk the word of God, I'll give you the word of God. He says he'll protect you. He won't let you bang your foot against a rock, right? Dash thy foot against a stone. And so he's using Jesus' tactics against him. And that's another thing that Satan does. He twists scripture. He pulls it out of context. Or he doesn't compare scripture with scripture. He's just pulling this one verse out and saying that anything you decide to do, God's going to protect you, and that's just not reality. Verse number 12, And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so you don't do anything that is going to force God's hand. Uh, you you submit to God, and you obey him, and you, you follow his uh, teachings and directions, but you don't do things that would force his hand, God will not be forced to take action. Verse 13, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him, look here, for a season. The devil may leave you for a time, but he's never gone for good. You can expect a return visit. That's why we daily, faithfully, steadfastly stay in the scripture so that we can answer the devil with scripture when he comes to tempt us. All right, I hate to do this. I got to blow my nose. I've been working around the house this morning and uh, I'm getting all clogged up. Pardon me just for a moment. All right, I'm back. Uh, if this weren't live, we wouldn't be doing things like that, right? <laughs> my apologies. Verse number 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth when he had been, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So he's been doing a little bit of traveling. He's been doing a little bit of preaching and teaching. He's been doing a little bit of healing. And those nations that are those cities and areas that he's been doing these things in, they're praising him. They're glorifying him. Now he goes back home to Nazareth. All right, let's see what happens. Well, first off, let me say in verse 16, he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And I like it says, as his custom was. You know what that means? Jesus faithfully attended the synagogue on the Sabbath. What does that mean for you and me? We ought to follow his example and faithfully attend church on the Lord's day. Of course, we don't go to synagogues. We go to church. We don't go on the Sabbath, which is Saturday for the Jews. We go on Sunday, which is the Lord's day. If Jesus was faithful to his synagogue, we ought to be faithful to church. So he gets up to read. They would allow folks other than rabbis to read and to speak in the synagogues. 
And he says this, verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. For the record, this is Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they all uh, bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? So here Jesus gets up to read. He reads Isaiah 61, which, by the way, the old evangelist Billy Sunday, anytime he would preach, he would leave his Bible open to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So Christ gets up and he reads that. He's basically reading the prophecy uh, of his ministry and his life. And he then tells the people, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears, implying I'm the one the Spirit of God is upon. And so all the people, as they listen to him, say, yeah, but wait a minute. Isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? See, he's from Nazareth, and these people don't take him seriously. He doesn't hold the weight with them that he holds with the other areas that he's gone to. The old saying is this, the guy from the next county over carrying a briefcase is an expert. Right? If we've never met him before, we don't know who he is, and he carries himself professionally, we tend to trust what he has to say. But if it's somebody we know, someone we're close to, we don't always give them the same weight in what they say or do as we would someone that we don't know. And he addresses this now, verse 23, and he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. He's basically saying, yeah, I know what you're saying out there, that I'm Joseph's son, but there will come a day when you're going to ask me for my help, and you're going to ask me to do here what I've done in other places. Verse 24, now he gives a couple of examples. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. We have an old saying that says, uh, familiarity breeds contempt. The more you know somebody, the less you're going to listen to them. And that's basically what he's saying here. No prophet is accepted in his own country. He's saying, that's why you're rejecting me, because you know me. Then he gives some examples, verse 25. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elesias, which is Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And so he gives two examples here of Elijah and Elisha helping non-Jews, helping Gentile people. And so what he's implying here is, you know what, you can go ahead and reject me, but there's plenty of people that are going to want what I have to say, and not all of them are Jews either. So how do they respond to that? Verse 29, 8, 28. And they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now he's angered them. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. So when he says these things, they rush him, they pick him up, carry him out of the building, out of the city to a cliff. And they're getting ready to throw Jesus over the cliff. We're only in chapter 4 and already he's having his life threatened. Now, you're not going to die until God's done with you. 
and the Lord wasn't done with Jesus here. And so what happens? Verse 30, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. Somehow, uh, supernaturally, spiritually, God delivered them from him and he just walked through the crowd and walked away from them. They, they can probably sit there and imagine like, what just happened? How did this, I mean, we had him, we had him to the edge of the cliff. We're ready to throw him over. Verse 31, so he leaves and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. Notice he leaves Nazareth. They don't want to hear what he has to say. Jesus told us, you don't cast your pearl before swine. And so you don't bother with people that don't want to hear your message. When I'm out soul winning, if I find somebody that just wants to argue, I just move on. I don't waste my time talking to people that want to argue with me. I'm looking for the person that wants to hear what I have to say. Next, uh, verse number 32, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. See the difference between Nazareth and Capernaum. And in the synagogue there was a man which had the spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. So here's a man who's demon-possessed. Notice the word unclean. Everything about Satan is unclean. Verse 34, saying, this is the demons talking to Jesus. Let us alone. So there's not just one. There's many demons in this man. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? So they know who he is. Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. That's very interesting, isn't it? That the demons know Jesus. Of course, he was there when they were cast out of heaven with Lucifer, who would become Satan, the devil. And so these demons know who Jesus is. Verse 35, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. So Christ is talking to the demons. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. So they threw him to the ground. The demons threw the man to the ground and then came out of him. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word, excuse me, is this. For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits. Excuse me, my pages are sticking together again. All right. And they come out. So the crowd watching sees, here's a demon-possessed guy, and they knew who Jesus was, and he just cast them out. This man can speak to demons, and they leave people's bodies. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. That's verse 37. By the way, demon possession was real in the Bible. It's real today. If you go to Galatians chapter 5, at the end of the chapter, you find the fruits of the Spirit. Nine fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. But before you get to that, you get to the works of the flesh. I personally believe all those works of the flesh are doorways that you and I can open into our lives for demonic oppression or for the lost possession. A saved person cannot be possessed with a demon. The Spirit of God always already indwells in them, and so no demonic spirit can. But the lost can be possessed by demons. The saved cannot be possessed, but we can be oppressed. We can allow those things into our lives. Verse 38, And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Now this is the disciple Peter, Simon Peter. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with great fever, and they brought him, besought him for her. So Peter's mother-in-law is very, very sick. She's probably on her deathbed, and so they asked Jesus to come and help with her. Notice the Roman Catholics teach that Peter is the first pope, but Peter's married here, uh, and he has a mother-in-law. We read of both of them in this verse. So this idea of the church leadership, the males there not being allowed to marry, is a fallacy. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 says, If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. If any man, uh, or let him be the husband of one wife. And so marriage is allowed within the ministry by those serving God. Verse 39. 
And he stood over her, Jesus standing over the mother-in-law, and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. So this lady's so sick, she's about to die. Jesus heals her, and she gets right up and goes to serve them, makes them some food. I don't know what she's doing. Verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had sick, any sick, with diverse diseases, brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. So Jesus doesn't want these demons declaring that he's the Christ, because he is. And he doesn't want Satan validating who he is. Remember when they accuse him, you cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub, meaning you cast out devils through Satan's power. You know, you're one of them. And so he tells these demons, shut up, don't speak, don't declare who I am. And of course, they have to obey. And uh, he, the reason he does it is because they don't want his validation. It's like when the sorcerer girl was following Paul around saying, listen to this man, he's a man of God. And Paul says, will you shut up? You know, you're not to be trusted. So if you validate me, then people aren't going to trust me. Next verse. Verse 42 uh, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. So these people, whereas the Nazarites, they were throwing him over uh, the side of the cliff. These people in Capernaum, they want him to stay. Uh, let's see here. Verse 43, and he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I sent. He said, you know, as much as I'd like to stay, I got to keep moving along. Other people need me too. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. And that's chapter number four. We see the early beginnings of Christ's ministry and uh, how God used him. So we started with the temptation of the devil. Then we see him reading in the synagogue and his own people trying to kill him. Then we see him casting out devils. Then we see him healing his Peter's mother-in-law. Then we see him, see him healing other people, casting out more demons, and saying, I got to move to the next town. So chapter number four in the books. Thanks for watching. Uh, 22 minutes here today. That's not bad, is it? Uh, about 30 seconds of verse today. Not that it's a race, but I don't know. I pay attention to these things for whatever reason. Like Love, share the post, please. Let's get the word out there. We'll see you tomorrow morning, Saturday, 10 a.m. Pray for our ladies heading down to Belleville, Michigan to a ladies' conference down there. Going to be a delightful time. We just pray for their safety and that the Lord will do a work in their hearts. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later.